Welcome back to Reddit Aliens, everyone. Hello again, and I'm John. Happy July. So today, a subject matter that could be a little downtrodden, but let's give it a go. What happened in your life that you were expecting to be joyful, but turned out to not be? Not safe for work. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Joy. My college graduation. I got a call on my way to the ceremony from one of my best friend's parents that he passed away from a freak accident at work. I was crying all through the graduation and everyone just thought they were tears of joy. Missy Mikey. Years ago, my ex-wife was doing her scuba cert in Cambodia. The dive shop is like, hey, show up at 7am, get on the boat, we'll take you to a beautiful island, you can hang out while your wife gets her cert. I'm like, hell yeah, sounds great. So, we show up at the dock and the dive shop is like, we usually have a much bigger boat, but it's having an engine issue, so we're going to take this smaller one. It was still a medium-sized boat, and so 12 or so of us got on board and set off for our 45-minute trip to the island. It's a beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky. Great. The first 30 minutes or so are great. It's super chill, boat is going, dive master starts to make coffee, passes around some fruit, it's a dream. And then we hit a big wave, and everyone laughs and is like, whoa, hold on to your coffee. Then another. Then a bigger one. Cue three hours of screaming, crying, and puking as our boat is absolutely ravaged by the sea. On at least three occasions, the boat is on its side as we dangle from the railing and the dive master tells us to prepare to go overboard. I can't even see the sky anymore. There are just huge waves on all sides of us at all times, just battering the boat, drenching everyone bags have gone overboard a long time ago. It was the most insane moment of my life. All you can see all around is water, gathering speed and coming to kill you, utterly powerless, reduced to an ant. Three Cambodian dudes were driving the boat, screaming at each other in a language I can't understand. At one point, one of the dudes jumps overboard, and the other two have to navigate to get him back. It's clear that we're in an exceptional moment. Anyway. This goes on for 3 hours instead of 45 minutes. The island was effing great. It's the most deserted place that I've ever been, except for one dude who built a cafe and has a huge garden of weed and an Italian chef who goes out and fishes every day and then feeds everyone at night. I've never seen so many stars. It was truly paradise. The way back, by the way, was placid, not a single wave, like coasting across a swimming pool. 45 minutes. A multi-day non-stop sailing race. Down and back the Washington coastline in glorious summer conditions on a 50-foot yacht. We did the event in 50 hours and it was probably 50 of the worst hours of my life. The first couple were okay. Started off at 9am on a Friday, very light winds, boats hardly moving. Then at 11am, 3 hours before forecast, a 30 to 35 knot wind from the direction we were meant to be going rolled in. Instead of 15 to 20 knot wind forecast, what followed was massive waves. This continued for the entire beat to our destination. One by one, everyone was so sick, wet, cold, and exhausted, they went down below to rest, leaving just myself and one other to double hand a 50 foot racing boat in 30 to 35 knots of wind. This continued all through the night. We had massive gear failure at about 3 a.m., which ended with the two of us on deck doing all the work being soaked inside of our wet weather gear. Within five minutes of our arrival at the marker, we are to sail around and then head back to where we started. The wind was just glancing off to nothing, and we drifted for hours in the now scorching heat the day after starting. Then I finally get to rest. After 24 hours straight, physically destroyed, I go down below, strip my gear off, and get into the only available bunk, and it's soaked to the core. Some asshole slept in the bunk in their wet weather gear and had ruined it. Nevertheless, I fall asleep after a while, tucked into the fetal position against the side of the hull. When I awake, I awake with possibly the worst sinus pain of my life. Turns out I'm allergic to mold, and this boat has mold in the hull lining. I spent the last 20 hours of the race with a thumping migraine, worst of my life. This is after only four hours of, I don't even know if you want to call it, sleep. It was so completely traumatic it changed my life. On a side note, it was so bad, everything else in life seemed so much better by comparison. I had the best sleep of my life after that, and work the next day was the easiest day ever. A wedding reception. 
Two of my army friends were marrying each other, and I thought it would be fun to attend, get drunk, and shoot the shit with some old friends from my training days. Ceremony was beautiful, and after party was fun for about two hours. They aren't religious at all, so nothing was religious about anything. Turns out the bride's mom was a nutjob evangelical, and she wasn't invited for a reason. It was an outdoor reception. Very beautiful. Lights strung between trees, candles on the tables, just the whole nine yards. Until the bride's mom showed up drunk and citing religious rhetoric. She called the groom a daughter-stealing devil worshipper. Bride didn't want to call the cops at first and asked a bunch of us to escort her away. I happily obliged. She left yelling and cursing. About 15 minutes later, as we're all doing shots, when we heard somebody yell, "Effing shit, the tables are on fire. A ton of us scrambled to find a source of water, while others tried to smother it with tablecloths. It took about 15 of us to finally smother it in wet towels and tablecloths. One girl's hair went up in flames when she was trying to help and suffered some light burns to her cheek, ear, and neck. Lo and behold, once the chaos ended, guess whose mom was passed the F out behind a nearby oak tree with a can of lighter fluid. Her mom got herself arrested that night on a felony charge and woke up in a jail cell the next morning begging her daughter, the bride, to bail her out. Her mom served five years in prison for her dumb assery. My first real makeout session. We were laying in the backyard at night on towels in the grass. An hour later she asks, what's that smell? And we look. We had been rolling in dog shit. We didn't see because it was dark outside. <laughs> That's fun. When my sisters were born, I was so excited to be the older sibling. Instead, my childhood was taken from me. My parents didn't hire a babysitter, they just used me. I've changed more diapers than them, did more late nights and feedings. I was 10 when they were born. Moving my now ex-boyfriend across the country. Life tip, listen to those doubts. Do not downplay them as having cold feet. Working as a corrections officer, at the academy they fill your head with the idea you're going to be helping people get their life on track and making a difference to help do better. I got a little bit of that, then transferred to a different prison and it was just chaos. The noise, the stress, the constant rolling around in shit and blood and doing constant first aid on people hell-bent on seriously harming themselves and you. My brain went sideways after about four years and hit the bottle pretty hard. I stopped trying to help people, I just got so used to the constant trauma my whole reality became warped. Being a mother. My daughter has a rare syndrome and it took almost seven years to diagnose. I didn't have more children because I didn't know if it was genetic. Everything becomes exponentially more difficult. Every parent worries, but fear of the future, things she may not be able to tell us, long term care, etc. can be overwhelming. She's amazing and I wouldn't trade her for anything. But my life as a mother, and in general, is very different than anything I could have ever imagined. Coming home from the United States Marine Corps, I could tell my wife just didn't want me back home. No one cared that I was finally back. People had all moved on and old friends wouldn't return text. She'd been having an affair for a while. She got all our shit and I was homeless for over a year trying to regain sanity. Few things spark joy anymore. It's too risky. Move on, brother. Not sure if the OP is actually listening to this, but if he is, I just want him to know, Marine to Marine, it will get better. And better now than later. She wasn't worth it. Move on. Westpac widows are garbage. My grandma took me and my brother camping for my birthday once, as my grandparents were packing me and my brother went on a walk. When we got back, me and him saw my grandma's dog on the road and went to go play with her. It was nice and all until we saw blood. We ended up having to put her down that day. I grew up with that dog so it was heartbreaking. Every time I go to my grandma's I always go to the small path behind her yard where her dog is buried. Graduating high school. Everyone said that college would be more fun but it's just stressful and I miss the routine of high school and having my friends close by. I didn't really make good friends in college. I'm transferring to university though for a different degree, so maybe it'll be different this time. Graduating college and finally being done with school. I thought, yes, finally free to live my life. But then I ended up stuck and unhappy at a 9 to 5 job related to no major for a few years. Then I finally get a job related to my major, only to realize that I'm unhappy there too. It all worked out in the end though, for the most part. Life's hard, man. 
My 18th birthday. Both my parents left the country, emigrated that month. My boyfriend broke up with me the morning of my birthday, and only two friends showed up. I planned a big party. Most didn't even cancel. Only one called to say she wouldn't be coming because the theme was stupid. I was so heartbroken. Being pregnant with my child. I was sexually assaulted as a child and he got me pregnant. Up until almost the ninth month, I was indecisive on whether I would keep her or not. I decided to keep her, only to lose her to leukemia, two years old. The first time I tried to have a permanent gastric stimulator placed, I had done a trial with a temporary version that helped a lot, so I was excited. Knew it'd be significant surgery recovery, but potentially life changing. Surgeon spent about three hours trying to get it in, but couldn't because the GJ tube I had was sitting right on top of where the leads had to go. I didn't have medical power of attorney set up at the time, boy do I now, so they had to close me up and wake me up to ask me what I wanted to do. Two days later, we do surgeries to remove the GJ, separate my stomach from my abdominal wall, and place a J tube, new spot, bummer, but now we just have to wait 8 weeks for the thing to heal and we can try again. Except, the very first time a nurse went to use the new J tube, it clogs. We spend the better part of 2 days with various teams trying to get it clear to no avail. Eventually my surgeon convinces one IR doc to change it with her dangerous that early, but only if we wait until it's been in place for about two weeks. In the meantime, my surgeon made me stay NPO and on NG suction that entire time. Eventually, we get it changed, and by that time it's been so long since anything had gone through my GI tract that restarting feeds or eatings is a bit rough. That was my longest hospital stay to date. Bright spots were when my mom brought a little sewing machine to the hospital for me so I could sew. And when I eventually did get the stimulator placed 8 weeks later. Worth it in the end, but what was supposed to be one surgery turned into like 4 and weeks in the hospital no one expected. I don't know if this counts because it was both joyful and traumatic. My two cousins and I decided to backpack the circumference of Mount St. Helens. We were in late September. As the date approached, it became clear that the weather was not going to be great. One of my cousins was coming in from across the country, however, so we locked into our dates. We could either do it then or call it off completely. We decided no sprinkles were going to stop us. We loaded out our packs and drove up to Climber's Bivouac to head west around the mountain. The first part of our hike was a scramble over jagged rocks, which were slick in the fog. The trail was only marked by piles of stones with ribbons around them, about 50 feet apart. But soon the fog was so thick we could barely see half the distance. About an hour in, one of my cousins decided he was in over his head, and he was going to turn back. We were completely taken aback. We'd been planning this for months, but we weren't going to try to force him. The thing is, he was our ride. We knew that there was no cell reception in most places around the mountain, so if he left, we were going to have to 1993 it, and make plans on when and where he was going to pick us up. It was about 36 miles around the mountain. We thought 12 miles a day would be nice, conservative approach. I'm in shape. I'll often run 12 miles at a go, piece of cake. I thought we'd redivided our supplies and parted ways. We didn't know it at the time, but my other cousin and I were consigning ourselves to a three day death march. 12 miles in a day is no problem on a sunny day on a flat surface, in shorts and a t shirt. I can run that in under two hours. But, on the side of a mountain, wearing our heaviest clothes to combat the cold, the wind, and the endless Pacific Northwest drivel, with a 30 pound pack over extremely rugged terrain, well, that's something entirely different. But now we had this schedule to keep. If we didn't make a rendezvous, there was no telling when or how or even if we'd be able to call for help. The rain never stopped. The weather had been 70s and sunny the week before, and it would be sunny the whole week after. But our three days on the mountain were an almost constant downpour. Even when the rain subsided into a soupy, drizzly fog, every blade of grass was saturated and deposited its payload onto our feet as we passed. Our painstakingly rainproofed hiking boots were constantly waterlogged. The temperature stayed in the low 50s during the day and got down toward freezing at night. When we redivided our supplies, the cousin who left wound up with the good tarp, 
So the rain got into our tent and soaked the feet of our rated to minus 30 degree sleeping bags. No sleeping bag is rated for anything when it's wet. We slept fitfully and marched all day to keep up the pace. We ate on the go and only stopped when we began to lose the light. We rarely saw the mountain through the Pacific Northwest fog, which also obscured the trail. On the morning of the third day, we took a wrong turn and wound up following a tiny path used only by volcanologists studying the caldera up above the snow line. In freezing temperatures and our wet clothes, sliding around yawning icy precipices on what we eventually figured out was a goat path. And as we backtracked, I started to wonder if we were ever coming down from that mountain. We had ditched more than half our food along the way to reduce the weight. We dumped water. There was no way to be thirsty. The frigid humidity was like 150%. Later that morning, my cousin informs me he hyperextended his knee doing a backflip four years ago, never had surgery on it, and now it was killing him. He was limping. My blisters were bleeding. I'll never forget coming down from the snow in the plains of Abraham. We saw the sun and the mountain for the first time in three days. The mountain forms a rain shadow. It's too tall for the rain clouds to get over it. And the valley on the eastern side was bathed in sun. We didn't have time to stop and the wind whipped us. The plain was harsh and beautiful. By about this time, my cousin is getting loopy from the lack of sleep and he starts shouting, yes, kill us, you glorious bitch, at the mountain. Then we had to go back up. This was the easiest the trail had been, but it was uphill, and we were both spent. I helped him limp back up the sloppy, dripping woods. Our legs ached. My blisters felt like walking on knives. After another long, cold march, we finally arrived at our destination three hours after we'd arranged, and I tell you, we literally flagged my cousin down as he was driving away to go find a search and rescue team. It was the most amazing, harrowing, triumphant journey of my life. I will hold the experience dear to my heart for the rest of my days. I'm going back there someday, when it's warm, sunny, and dry. My wedding. Not getting married, that's been great, but the actual wedding. We tried so hard to make sure my husband's family could make it, and that they would have fun and have an open bar, that the bridesmaids didn't have to pay for a dress they would probably never wear again, etc. We ended up so stressed. Everyone had a good time, but we were miserable the day of. We'd been married for 11 years now, and we both agreed that if we could do it again, we would have just eloped and saved the money for a house. It probably doesn't help that we're both autistic, and just the stress of making sure we did what was considered normal for everyone was just exhausting. You know, it didn't go the way you hoped or planned, but you finished, and you did it, and that's great. Next time will be more fun.